Okay, so uh, just to give you an overview of what we're discussing today, um, I'll tell you a bit about myself and um, what ELAW is. We'll talk about some of the naming conventions of predictive coding, uh, what the need is why we're talking about this, um, how we actually evaluate search technology, how um, effective uh, other technologies are, and then compared to analytics, uh, what scenarios analytics can actually be used in, how the underlying engine uh, works, uh, what we call the six main features of analytics actually within the software itself. Uh, a few case studies uh, that we've run where we've done some testing um, of the software. Um, a bit what's happening in the market here in Australia uh, and globally. And then assuming uh, we don't run out of time, I'll actually show you a quick little demo uh, of a couple features to kind of help explain you know, how it works in practice. Okay, just a slide about myself. Um, I'm originally from the U.S. and I got my start at the U.S. Department of Justice, U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, I worked there for a number of years. Uh, one of my biggest cases was a uh, fraud, consumer fraud case uh, involving uh, telephone cramming. This is where uh, people would call for a free psychic reading and be charged $30 a month for voicemail after that. It seems like this insane scheme, but it actually worked. Uh, where they, they charged a billion dollars to five million victims over 10 years. Uh, it's interesting in that case because we had about a million documents and we did linear review. We had about 20 agents from FBI, IRS, a few other state agencies, and we manually reviewed uh, a million documents over a two-year period. Um, if we had some of these tools, which we're going to discuss today, I think we would have done that uh, very differently. That was in, uh, I think, 2003 uh, when we did that case. Uh, I've also worked as a, a consultant to uh, several New York City law firms for a number of years. And then for the last six years, I've been uh, here at ELAW in Australia. Um, I'm currently the head of client solutions, I'm basically working with software um, like Relativity uh, and, and, our, and help design the workflow um, for our clients to really to review documents in bulk. Uh, just a bit about ELAW. Um, we've been around since 1999. Uh, I think it was March, so we just had our 16th year anniversary. Uh, we merged with another firm called Systematics, which is a similar kind of document review software uh, firm uh, last year. Uh, we have a long history of running really e-discovery matters. Um, also, the, the firm got its start in the uh, Royal Commission uh, e-court space. Um, and that's really still our focus, that kind of e-courts and electronic discovery review. Okay, so <clears throat> my first slide on analytics here. There's really multiple names in the industry at this point for what we're just talking about today. Um, you know, it's sometimes called analytics, concept searching, predictive coding, technology assisted review, or TAR. Computer assisted review or CAR, uh, clustering technology or categorization. And now a lot of these names, it's kind of like you know, Xerox and photocopier. A lot, a lot of these are, are kind of different products in the industry are calling different components, different names. So the industry hasn't been great. The software providers haven't been very good at kind of normalizing the names. And one product might call a certain feature. Um, a certain thing, and then another product will call their entire, uh, another company will call their whole product that same um, name. So it's a bit confusing. I find generally when people are talking about this sort of software kind of at a high level, they'll use any of these terms listed here. And really just, I guess, don't be uh, put off by that. Um, you know, I had always called it analytics when I was kind of learning about this. And then I heard people talking about predictive coding, and I didn't really know what that was. Uh, fundamentally, it's all kind of the same thing. Um, but it, uh, <clears throat> it has kind of different names, um, uh, just depending on kind of who's talking about it. So um, that being said, and now you've seen kind of some of the names, let, let me launch um, another poll here. And this is, who has actually heard of anything to do here with... Um, this analytics predictive coding technology before. 
Okay, so actually a pretty, pretty even split there uh, between never heard of it, know the concept, seen the demo, and actually used it in a live matter. So oh, maybe a few more that know the concept uh, but haven't actually used it in a live matter. Okay, so why are we talking about this analytics predictive coding software? Um, basically, there's lots of great features in you know modern review platforms. Uh, really helpful to help you kind of get through documents quickly. Uh, you know, pivot tables, you know, graphical reporting, um, all sorts of analysis that can be done on your documents. Why is this one helpful? And why is it getting so much press? And really being kind of heralded as a game changer in how uh, the legal team operates. So let's just take a step back. Um, traditionally, you would use either linear review or keyword searching. So linear review, you're, it's that million document case I had where the 20 of us reviewed every single document over a two year period. Um, that worked when we had you know a billion dollar case. Um, when you have a $10 million case, you can't put 20 people on it for two years. Um, so keyword searches are the other kind of norm being used. Now keyword searches kind of have their, um, their failing points, um, especially on really large sets. You know, keywords, if you've ever done a matter with this, you, you, know, you start putting in more and more keywords and you just start getting back all sorts of junk. And yes, there'll be you know some good documents in there, but it's just lots and lots of irrelevant documents. So the keywords start to lose their effectiveness on really large data sets. So what analytics does is it it helps to kind of address some of the problems with keywords uh, and help uh, more efficient and effective use of keywords. And then another part of analytics actually seeks to replace keywords and not use keyword searching at all. And I'll talk a bit more about that. So really, at a minimum. Analytics is going to help the existing uh, methodology of keywords, and at a maximum, it's actually it will replace it and really help provide a much better insight and, and direction of, of where to drive the case. In order to, under, in order to understand a bit about what were, um, I guess, the, the various strengths and weaknesses of, of the various ways to conduct a review, we need to understand a bit of the, I guess, scientific terminology around review science. So there's two terms here I want to define, uh, recall and precision. So what recall is, recall is, <clears throat> it gives us the amount of, uh, it gives us, it's basically recording how many out of our universe of documents, our universe of relevant documents, how many are we actually finding? And how many are we leaving behind and, and missing? So how many you know, documents are we missing um, in a set of relevant documents? Now, you know, if we had you know, one folder of documents and a senior reviewer who knew the case perfectly and they reviewed that one folder, recall would be 100%. We're sure that they're going to find every relevant document in our universe. When we start using keywords, well, right away there's uncertainty that we might not be using the right keywords or our keywords might not be pulling back all of the relevant documents. So right away our recall is starting to go down and, and at what level um, will we need to measure that. Um, the flip side of this is precision. So for example with you know your keywords you may say well I, I don't want to miss any documents, any relevant documents so I'm going to write really broad keywords, anything that could possibly uh, come up. And that's a, a common approach and the end result is then you get this big set back uh, and yes you know all your relevant documents, or most of them, will be in there, but you have tons and tons of irrelevant documents. So you're spending, you know, huge amounts of ultimately the you know, client's money on reviewing irrelevant documents. So recall and precision measures kind of how many documents, relevant documents, are we you know, missing, and how much time are we wasting reviewing irrelevant documents. And we really want these two to be kind of uh, as high as possible. We want as many relevant documents as possible want to just be reviewing relevant documents, not reviewing the relevant documents. Now, you may be thinking, wait a minute, what are you talking about? We're missing relevant documents. 
And sometimes this is a bit of the kind of elephant in the room with electronic discovery review and using keywords. You know, as soon as we go down that keyword road, we're highly, it's highly likely that we're actually missing some relevant documents. Now, is that appropriate? Are we, you know, is the legal team you know, abdicating their responsibilities and their obligations? Well, let's actually look what the obligations are. So, depending on the jurisdiction, um, the various courts actually give guidelines on what you're supposed to do uh, when finding relevant documents. So federal court rules uh, says you need to conduct a reasonable search. So not an exhaustive search, but a reasonable search. Um, and only find documents that are directly relevant uh, to the issues uh, in the pleadings. Um, New South Wales, Queensland, uh, all the various states, they talk about Really, they use this language, relevant, directly relevant, reasonable search. Um, that's pretty much how most of the other states as well, uh, directly relevant, relevant, etc. cetera. Uh, again, reasonable search. Uh, this language is, is throughout it, throughout pretty much all the states. So what does that mean, then, a reasonable search? Does it mean we have to find every single document? Well. Uh, one of the considerations to take into account is this concept of proportionality. So courts have actually, Australian courts have actually given um, guidance on this. Really, your, your, if you have a $10 million claim, you can't spend $5 million doing the discovery review on legal fees. Uh, it's just not proportionate to do that exhaustive review um, for the size of the claim. Uh, and in, uh, a famous case here, the Seven Network versus News Limited. Uh, the parties actually spent two hundred million dollars, but the claim was actually for two hundred million dollars. So the uh, um, court was not not ha having quite scathing in in uh, the opinion. Um, so we're in this position where we have, you know, in, in my case we had a, a million documents to review, but we had you know a, a billion dollar claim. You know, quite frequently we have 100,000 documents for, you know, a few million dollar claim. Um, these are often, the, you know, the cases that come across uh, that we work on. And so you can't, you know, review every single one of those documents. Well, then should we start using keywords? Um, that's kind of the default norm at the moment. Um, but this assisted review and predictive coding is kind of giving the promise of a better way to do that. And out of the U.S., we have um, Judge Peck giving some guidance saying, you know, what the bar should take away from this opinion is that computer assisted review is an available tool and should be seriously considered um, for use in large data volume cases. So it's definitely on the radar um, in the US. Uh, well, actually, it's, it's more than that. It's being used heavily and, and endorsed by the judiciary. Um, and here in Australia, it's being used, um, but we don't have that, that ruling um, kind of discussing it and, and advocating for it. Um, Okay, so how effective is analytics compared to keyword searching? Well, let's talk about keyword searching first. There's a, a well, an often cited study um, from 1985 um, by Blair and Marin, and you know, in, I say it's 1985, but keyword searching technology hasn't really changed at all since that time. So they had there was a rail accident. Um, it was in San Francisco. They had a document set of 40,000 documents that had been reviewed as part of a, a real litigation. Um, they were able to access these documents. And so they had a few kind of test researchers or test subjects. And I think it was a partner, a senior associate, senior associate, and a paralegal. And they were basically given the task of trying to come up with keywords and keyword searches um, that they thought were, could, would, were, they were allowed to tinker with these keyword searches um, with the software. And when they, you know, Put a few in, see the results, change them around, see the results, etc. And they basically were said, when you think you've found 75% of the relevant documents, or, or your searches are going to find 75% of the relevant documents in this case, stop, um, and then we'll analyze how effective it is. So they tinkered around, um, they did that, and they, they were confident that they had found 75% of the relevant documents, or their searches were going to find it. So then the researchers actually analyzed the results of those uh, keyword searches compared to the true relevance of, of every document because they knew it, it was historic. And what they found was 
these keyword searches, actually we're only finding 20% of the relevant documents in the case. So that's a really quite a shockingly low recall rate, um, 20%. You know, four fifths of the relevant documents in the case are being missed entirely. So there's been a few studies on this um, done. It is possible to get higher levels of recall with um, keywords, but it's often quite difficult in practice to achieve. The kind of flip side of you know trying to cull down your set using more narrow keywords is to actually use really broad keywords, and that's where you you know brainstorm everything under the sun, and uh, you know search for kind of everything uh, potentially relevant. And you can do that, but what we found, and we actually ran a case study where we studied this, is you know, we had a case thirty five thousand documents um, as the results of keywords, and in the end only twenty eight hundred of them. 2,800 of them were actually relevant. So that's an 8% precision rate, which means that you know 92% of the documents reviewed was really just a waste of time, time and cost. So that's kind of keywords and some of the problems with keywords. Um, junior reviewers are, or contract reviewers are used quite commonly um, in large document review. And what we find is, you know, you might say, all right, well, let's let's use maybe. Um, we can't maybe miss relevant documents. I want a human to look at every single one of these. And often that's talked about as kind of the gold standard that you know, a trained lawyer looks at every single document. What we find in practice is the junior reviewers um, often are, are not experienced. They don't fully understand the case to the same level that you know what the lead senior associates would. They're you know they're reviewing hundreds of documents a day, many of which are irrelevant. And they suffer from document fatigue. So they're just being shown non-relevant, non-relevant, non-relevant documents, and they, they just don't notice when a document is relevant. Um, I'll talk a bit more about this um, when I go through the, our case study slides. But it's pretty universal that we hear that there are real challenges with using large teams of junior reviewers um, for consistency uh, and accuracy. So analytics has, and, and why we're excited about this, is it actually has the potential um, and has shown that we can actually achieve really high recall and precision rates. So you know, 75 to 80, we're finding 75 to 80 percent of the relevant documents, and of the documents we're reviewing, you know, 75 to 80 percent are actually relevant. We're not making, wasting much time uh, reviewing irrelevant documents. So how does the actual underlying technology work? So a traditional keyword search uh, engine builds an index. This would be just like, it's exactly like your old encyclopedia, where you can flip to the back of your textbooks from uni, and you know the various words used in the book are in the back, and it tells you which page number they're on. That's exactly how a keyword search index works. Literally, if you type in the word, it's going to tell you which, bring back the documents that that word no fewer and no less. So what the analytics engine does is it does build an index. It, it kind of analyzes all the documents in uh, the, the case. And it starts building this, uh, I guess, think of it as a three-dimensional map of documents. And documents that are similar to each other, it starts plopping kind of next to each other so that they're in this, they're, they're all mapped out. So later when you're searching for one particular document, you can say, show me others that are similar. And it goes to that three-dimensional map and pulls back any documents near it. It does this for documents. It also does it for words. Uh, one of the examples that I like to give is if you have a, a bunch of documents talking about um, pet cats and a bunch of documents talking about pet dogs, it'll actually learn that dogs and cats are related because they're both being talked about as pets. So even if nowhere in, the, in your documents cats and dogs are in the same place, it's still learning that they're related because somewhere people are talking about Um, this this may sound like you know magic um, science here, but actually, uh, if you've been using your kind of Google search engine, you'll notice you know when you type in those three words, it somehow magically, often in the first page, will bring back a website that you're looking for. You know, it'll bring back, it'll say you know 10 million websites, but the one that you're looking for is right in the beginning. Google's using different algorithms than analytics technology, but the, the 
goal is the same, that you can type in a few kind of familiar language words and it actually finds you the documents that you're looking for. Um, so it has that same promise of that really easy Google-like searching. Um, here I just have a slide of that kind of three-dimensional um, map that gets that gets created in a three-dimensional index. And documents that are similar to each other get they pop down in the kind of universe right next to each other. Now I have it displayed as a three-dimensional map. In reality it's uh, something like a hundredth dimensional uh, map, uh, which of course you can't really put that on the screen. Uh, but just be aware of that. Okay, so there are some limitations on when this technology can be used. It needs just a certain number of documents um, to be able to build that map. Um, so we often say it needs between 10 and 50,000 documents. It depends, you know, if they're really small emails, that's not great. Um, we really want a lot of um, body content, so the actual content of the documents. We ignore the to's and from's. Um, basically, the to's and from's are actually not a good way to teach the software you know, what concepts are related to each other. Because if I'm a kind of a custodian in this case, you know, I might have 20% of the documents in the case, and my name's just going to be all over the place. It's, it's not good for teaching the system concepts. So we actually ignore the kind of the to's and from's in that kind of metadata. metadata. We only look at what's actually inside the document. Okay, um, let's talk a bit about what the actual features uh, of uh, the software in practice actually are. So we have keyword expansion, concept searching, clustering, similar documents, categorization, and assisted review. And we're mainly talking about them from a relativity perspective, um, what relativity calls them. Other products call them often something slightly different, but often they do this, the same thing. So keyword expansion. This uh, is useful for when you're developing your own keywords. You know, what are we going to search for in this set? And often there's some brainstorming that goes on. A few kind of words are run through to see, you know, what, what's actually in there. But what's really helpful with this is the analytics engine has created a thesaurus that's customized just for your case. So it doesn't use any outsourced, outside sort of, you know, web thesaurus or anything like that. It analyzes only the documents in your case, and so then you can put in a word, say cat, and it'll come back with dog, even though cat and dog are never in the right, in the same, you know, search. So you wouldn't have thought necessarily to search with the word dog before, but once you, know, you feed this in and see that they're actually quite related, you say, all right, well, let's let's search for this. So this is often really useful when your your clients are using terms. You know, they might have project names um, that you're not familiar with. They might have um, you know, terminology, scientific terminology or industry terminology that you're not familiar with that you wouldn't necessarily be searching on. Um, the keyword engine tries to bring that out. Um, at the end, I'll show you a real case um, where we, we get some insight from using this thesaurus. Okay, so there's actually uh, concept searching. And what this is, um, this addresses the problem of keyword searching where you're looking for a certain document you know it's in there, you think it's in there, but you don't know the exact words or phrases that, it, that are used in the document. So what concept searching does is it allows, similar to the Google um, search, where you can type in kind of a free language you know, text, and often the more words you put in, actually the better. Um, and then it just goes out and tries to find documents related to that paragraph. And so the syntax doesn't have to match exactly. Um, which is really beneficial when you're kind of searching. You don't know exactly what you're searching for. So actually what we do um, as an exercise with clients often is we actually tell them, well, are you looking, you know, what's the smoking gun, the proverbial smoking gun that you're looking for here? Can you actually make it up? Just, you know, get out, get on your writer's hat and actually create that fictional document. And then we'll feed that into the concept search and see if any documents come back that are related to that. So kind of a useful way to find you know, the key documents that you're looking for without having to know the exact syntax. Clustering is useful when you might have just received a bunch of documents from uh, your client, 
you might have received diamonds from the other side, and you kind of want a, a quick snapshot into, well, how are these diamonds made up? What do they relate to? And, and in what volumes does each section relate to? So you can basically point it at, you know, say 5,000 diamonds from the other side, and it actually does a first pass review for you. It creates, it looks to see where the diamonds are kind of clumped together conceptually, and then it draws up a kind of a box around them, shows you that box, and it names that box of documents for you. Um, so it's completely machine um, run. There's no human input. And, you know, in minutes, you can kind of get a quick overview of well, what's the breakdown of these documents. And then assign out, you know, the most relevant looking ones for review first. Um, include similar documents is useful for, you know, you may find, you know, 10 documents that are related to a specific issue, maybe they're privileged documents, and you want to ask the system, well, are there any other documents in here like it? So with just kind of a quick kind of flick, you can choose the 10 documents and say, show me all the other ones that are conceptually similar, and it'll pull those documents back. So you may have found a bunch of hot documents, you want to feed those in and see what else is. Categorization is a little bit similar to include similar documents. It's just there's a bit more workflow built into it. So this is actually where we really try to train the system on a specific issue. So I would ask, you know, the legal team to find me maybe 20 examples of a document that relates to a specific issue, and then potentially even the text within those documents that relates to the specific issue. Because you might have a large document where only one paragraph relates to it. And we also ask, we want, you know, maybe 20 documents that don't really relate to anything else. We, you know, I want them only to relate to that one issue, not, not multiple other issues. And uh, then we ask the engine to show us any other documents that are related to those, say, 20. Um, the review team will actually review those documents and, you know, find them, yes, it's related, no, it's not, and it'll learn from that. So we can get really targeted on a specific issue using this feature. Assisted review is a bit kind of on from there further. Um, this is actually what's getting really a lot of the buzz and the headlines. Um, it's this assisted review, also the core of it is kind of known as predictive coding. So how does it actually work? So the first thing we do is we create a control set. The control set is a completely random set of documents, typically a thousand. We take that random set, we have the senior reviewer review it, and then we put it to one side. Now we're going to use that later on to test how well is our software doing at actually determining relevance. And it does that based off of, you know, compares its results to, you know, what it thinks is the control set would, should be like. And we compare that to what the senior associate said. So it's a good benchmark on how the software is actually doing. So uh, effectively, we then get a senior reviewer to start reviewing rounds of documents. So they might start with 2,000 documents. This is after the control set has been put aside. They go through and review for relevant or not relevant. The software then analyzes those decisions in the documents and then, and then makes a call on the rest of the database and then reports back how confident it is. We you know, might want a higher level. We might, we'll probably have to go through several iterations of this before we kind of reach the high you know, recall standard aiming for. Here's just a, a quick slide on how the actual um, uh, software works. You know, first the software creates that random sample, then in orange the uh, legal review team reviews the sample. Uh, down here in blue the universe, basically the software learns from those decisions and then the universe gets recategorized. And then the, the human reviewers have to validate the results and teach it. No, you're wrong about this. And yes, you're right about this. Uh, sometimes it will, if humans are inconsistent, they mark two documents, you know, one, the same document or similar. One is relevant, one is not. It'll actually highlight those and say, I'm confused here. Did you make a mistake? You know, clarify. These look like they're, they're the same document. Here's just a breakdown of that same workflow. You know, we start with a million documents. The human review trains it with a thousand. System breaks down. Okay, well, three hundred thousand are relevant, and seven hundred thousand are not relevant. We then 
continue to train it, and based off each each kind of iteration, it gets a little bit better um, in its results. Okay, um, let's talk about some of the um, case studies. So we had a case study where we had two million documents. Uh, we had found, or the, the legal team had found a few key documents, but they were trying to find other um, key documents in here. So what we did was we used this categorization feature. Um, they, we fed in those 20 key documents, and then basically it went out and found other documents that were similar to it. Um, the legal team then reviewed those and said, you know, yes, they're relevant, or no, they're not. So we are just able to find some other relevant documents when really keyword searches you know, were failing. Um, clustering, uh, really, well, we just used this in practice. We had, there was 100,000 documents from the other side. You know, the review team didn't really know where to start. You know, should they do keywords? Should they just, you know, dive in? So we actually used this clustering software. It split up those 100,000 into kind of 10 to 20 subtopics, which then it was much easier to see which ones were the relevant topics, which were then assigned out for kind of first review by keywords. Okay, so we actually did some evaluation on some of the features. So the first thing we evaluated was the clustering feature. So what clustering is supposed to do is, you know, you take your 10,000 documents, it breaks them into, you know, 10 nice little groups, labels them, and then assigns the documents against those clusters. So, you know, there might be 500 in the first cluster, there might be 2,000 in the second, 1,500 in the third, 100 in the fourth, etc. So we want to know first, do the cluster titles accurately guide us um, towards you know, the documents that are conceptually similar? And you know, you'd expect that the, the way it draws the documents, well all those documents, the way it draws the clusters, all the documents within there, they should really be all relevant or all not relevant. Because if they're related to each other, that would, that would stand to reason. Um, and then, you know, how good are the titles that it's naming it? And, you know, are the, the documents in there really relevant to the titles, and then are they relevant to the case in general? And finally, can we disregard the clusters that appear to be non-relevant at all? So we uh, asked these questions. We had um, a senior associate at uh, one of our um, law firm clients who's lovely enough to partner with us for this study. And she went through and we asked her, you know, how good were the titles that it came up with? And she basically said, um, well, I'll just paraphrase here. She selected one of the clusters. She quickly skimmed the document titles. And that's kind of how we ask. That's how we say you should determine whether the cluster is relevant. And she said in here, you know, the documents looked, did appear to be relevant. So she reviewed one of the, it actually creates subclusters. Um, it had 600 documents. And then she decided, you know, does it actually go with this um, cluster, and are they relevant to the case itself? So what actually we found was, she found that 86% of the documents within that cluster were actually relevant to the cluster. And then how many were actually relevant to the, to the matter? 29% um, of the documents in that cluster were actually relevant to the matter. Now keep in mind, that may sound low, but this is actually the general relevance in the case was 8% uh, in the document. So this is actually significantly above um, that, that rate. And the final question with cluster we asked was, can we just not review the clusters that the titles don't appear to be relevant? So we actually had to review the non-relevant title, the non-relevant clusters to see if we could ignore them. So we had to review four of them. And she said, for most of them, there was only a handful of relevant documents. Um, but for cluster 10, which had 750 documents, over 100 relevant documents were in there. So based in part on this, we, our, our guidance is you can't completely disregard uh, clusters that don't appear relevant. You still need to, to review them. You can probably get away, possibly get away with just reviewing the title, so it's much, much quicker. Um, but there still can be relevant documents within uh, non-relevant appearing OK, 
okay. Um, basically, I think I've just set out my conclusion. Um, we can rely on clusters to accurately group documents together. We can't rely on the titles exclusively. So the workflow we tell um, our clients is that you know somebody who really knows the case needs to look at these clusters and start skimming them and reviewing uh, the titles of the documents to make sure that the, the titles of the clusters actually are either relevant or irrelevant. And then we'll divvy up the documents based off those clusters, usually most relevant first, at least relevant. Now, we ran an assisted review um, case study. So this is, we had a great opportunity where we had run a live case um, with one of our clients. They had 35,000 documents, all reviewed by junior reviewers. They were really unhappy with the junior review team. The senior associates had to overturn uh, a lot of their decisions. They had to re-review a lot of the 35,000 documents. Um, and, you know, I. I'd like to say this is a one-off, but we hear this pretty regularly. It's really a challenge to, to effectively manage a large new junior reviewer. So the first thing we did is we looked at how effective the junior reviewers actually were. So we analyzed uh, their decisions compared to the overturns that the senior associates did. And we found that the junior reviewers uh, were about 50% uh, they had a 50% recall. What that means is for every two relevant documents placed in front of them, they marked one is relevant and one is not relevant. So it's really not very good uh, if we're trying to get a high level of recall. So what we did then with the software is we had just the one senior associate re-review um, kind of a portion of the document set and feed that into the coding um, system. So we found that once she had gotten to 4,500 documents, uh, the software was, it reached 50% recall, which was kind of just as good as the junior reviewers. Uh, yet, you know, we'd only reviewed 15% of the set rather than the whole thing. So we really wanted to get higher than 50%. We wanted to get up to 80%. Um, and so we found that once 10,000 documents up to 35,000 were reviewed by the senior associate, we were then able to reach um, that 80% recall, um, which is even Judge Peck and some other sources say, you know, that's the what your goal should be. Is you should be aiming for 75 to 80 percent recall uh, of the, the relevant documents. Okay. Um, so why um, the U.S. and the U.K. seem to be embracing this technology? Um, Australia has been a bit slower um, to it. I mean, often kind of new technology is just a little bit behind um, in Australia versus the U.S. the U.K. I think with some of the law firms, they're actually quite intimidated by this technology because it has the possibility of greatly reducing the number of hours spent on document review. So, you know, if you're in charge of the finances, we'd well, say, well, why should, why should I do this? And, of course, we would have the argument, you know, you're going to be much more efficient, you can take on more cases, and you can you know, beat out your competitors. Um, but well, we'll see. Um, we there was a, a, a study in um, 2013 that said you know they want to see itemized e-discovery, and I know there's at least one top ten firm doing um, e-discovery review by kind of per document, and then they're using analytics to help kind of make sure they can meet um, the, the, those kind of uh, benchmarks. Uh, documents, the cases are actually getting larger. So, you know, we now routinely have multiple, several hundred thousand documents for, you know, a few million dollar claim. So we're going to need tools to be able to quickly and, ch and really cheaply uh, review a large amount of documents. Um, there is acceptance. Um, yeah, probably about 25% of the cases that we run now use some sort of form of analytic software. Um, obviously, from the U.S., there's some great rulings uh, from Judge Peck, which we cite a lot, um, and he's really a, a huge supporter of this. We haven't had a you know ruling from uh, the Australian uh, legal community yet, but you know we we had a panel. We had you know Justice Beasley of New South Wales sitting on the panel saying you know bring me the case and I'll give you a ruling on this. I'm excited to use it. 
you know, the courts are generally quite pro uh, technology if it re if it brings the cost of a review down. Okay, um, we have a few minutes here, so I'm going to swap over and actually show you in practice a couple of these features. Okay. Hopefully you can see here um, relativity. I'm just going to log in. Log into a demo case here. And you should be able to see some kind of emails uh, on the screen here. So this is 74,000 documents that are in uh, the Enron case, so the large uh, accounting scandal from 15 years ago um, where they were hiding losses uh, in off-the-book entities and Arthur Anderson was signing off on it as an acceptable accounting practice. So uh, let's I'm gonna look at three of the features that we talked about. Um, the first one is the keyword expansion. So how this works is we can actually type in a word here and ask for its meaning in this case. So let's type in the word fraud. So I normally would accept, expect words like you know theft and deceit um, if we put this into a, a regular um, thesaurus, but this is the, a thesaurus just for these 74,000 documents. So we put this in here, and it comes back, the most related terms to fraud in this data set are accountant, Anderson, Anderson's auditor, Arthur. So it kind of gives us some insight right there, well, why is Arthur Anderson, you know, really being, uh, somewhere in here people are talking about fraud and Arthur Anderson together. Um, the next one is, let's put in, um, let's actually put in a, a Star Wars character, Jedi, right? And we see here Jedi, Chuko, off the books are all related to each other. Now, what actually was happening in this case is they were naming these off the book entities after Star Wars characters as a way to hide them. And you know you would never be searching for Star Wars characters, but you might be searching for off the book um, entities and off the books entities. And somewhere in here, somebody's talking about off the books entities, and then they're talking about Jedi or Chuko in the, using the same language. So it may not even be in the same kind of email or documents, but they're being talked about in the same way. It's in it's our you know, pet dog and pet cat um, example again. So again, really useful if. You know, you're not sure with all the words in the data set, you know, your client is using confidentiality and project names, um, or you know, various industry names, or they're hiding, you know, losses in intentionally hidden off the book entities. Um, the software can then help. The next feature I'll show you um, has to do is the include similar documents. So I'm just going to pull up our privilege list here. So this is 48 documents. Now let's just think, how did we actually generate um, our privilege list? We brainstormed every lawyer's name and law firm's name we could think of that had worked on this case, plugged it into the system, it brought back a certain number of documents, we reviewed those documents, privilege yes, privilege no. Now what are some problems with our methodology? Well, maybe there were some lawyers who worked on this we weren't aware of. Maybe one of the firms changed their name or their you know, email name. Um, we're not going to then, we're going to miss those documents. So what we can ask the uh, analytics um, engine to do is to just include all documents that it thinks are conceptually similar to these 48. So in a way, we're teaching it the concept of privilege. So I to ask it, you know, include similar documents. And we've jumped up to 390. So let's uh, exclude anything we've already marked. privileged. We have these 342. Look, these could have nothing to do with those documents, but it's a great QA check to make sure that, you know, what we're about to produce we're not, doesn't actually contain any privileged documents. Okay, so let's 
clear that out and I'll show you the final um, feature here. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, some uh, clusters. So I have here um, Mike Maggi, his emails. There's a total of uh, just under 2,000 of his emails. Mike Maggi was an executive at Enron. And we ran the clustering engine on his uh, email set, on these 2,000 emails. We've asked it here, you know, what's the breakdown of the documents of his 2,000? So it's gone through and it's clumped them together here. So we see Rabarsky Nelson, these are two women who work um, at Enron. And again, it's not using the people to determine the, the clusters, but it might title them uh, by this. Enron.com, maybe that has to do with the uh, website. Vous Erreur, that's some, uh, maybe some French documents. Uh, assets, there's gas assets or continued business assets. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into this first one. Rabarsky Nelson, almost half of his emails are about this topic. And let's see what's going on here. So let's look at some of these. So um, from Amanda to uh, Mike. Let's go ahead and click in and look at this uh, document. Okay, from Mike to Amanda. I like the glasses. From Amanda to Mike. Well, then I guess I'm going to have to wear them more often. Let's jump ahead. Okay, so this is Michelle Nelson, another woman, uh, emailing with Mike. From Mike to Nelson, jerk. From, uh, from Michelle to Mike, I'm funny, don't you think? Nope. Okay, you are boring. Okay, so there's some casual conversation going on here. Let's just uh, try to get a bit more of a gist. So let's sort by date order. And we'll go back to the beginning of his emails in this cluster. And what's this? There's another woman in here, Amanda Hubble. So another uh, Amanda. Let's click in and see what they're, he's talking about with her. Okay. Um. <clears throat> You better be careful about drinks. I think you might be in trouble. From Mike to Amanda. Maybe I like trouble. That was a good comeback. I knew you would like it. By the way, where is my present? Okay, I think we've reviewed enough here of this cluster, and we can determine that uh, Mike is actually uh, a bit of a sleazy guy in the office, and he's flirting with these three women. Um, now, how is this helpful to us? Well, I guess it depends on our case. First of all, did the software successfully lump uh, relevant doc or conceptually similar documents together? Yes, it did. Now it's us, it's up to us to decide whether they're relevant to the case or not. So it depends what this case is about. If this is an accounting scandal, well then no, probably they're not particularly relevant and we can review these either last or just by the titles or, or have a junior reviewer review them. Um, or um, it's a sexual harassment case, in which case these are highly relevant and, you know, the gas assets really isn't relevant. The important thing here is the clustering engine just groups together similar documents, so then you can be reviewing conceptually similar documents, uh, which is just much more efficient than kind of jumping around all over the place. Okay, um, I think that's all I wanted to show for uh, the demo. Let's stop my uh, screen share, and I think now we'll take any uh, questions. So you can type them into the box over on the left. Okay. From John, Jeff, it's dependent on having all the relevant documents at first instance. Can you use analytics to determine the baseline set of documents? So I assume this is, um, are you asking, I guess, 
is this in, in, in terms of training the system um, to, to find the, the relevant documents? Um, or are you talking about kind of earlier in the collection phase when you're kind of talking with your client about where relevant documents are? Maybe you could just clarify that question. Okay, earlier in the collection phase. So uh, really no. Um, this, well, I say no. Um, this software really relies on you having all the documents in kind of one place, such as a you know, relativity database. Um, there is some work being done in the information governance space um, where corporations are actually kind of actively indexing everything in their uh, entire corporate network uh, on an ongoing basis, kind of ready for litigation. So. I say no, that analytics really isn't effective in the collection phase normally, um, but we are seeing some corporations kind of using this software earlier on uh, in the process. Hopefully that, that helps uh, a bit answer your question. Uh, okay, next question from Alan. Some searches uh, are based on negative or excluding searches. Do these need specific coding to create these within the process of creating relevant documents? Okay, so... Uh, making sure I understand your question, Alan. Um, I, mean, I think I understand your question, Alan. Are you asking, you know, you're, you're making your, the, these searches based on negative or excluding searches, you're using probably keywords to try to come up with uh, certain results. And you know maybe you know excluding these words but not these other words. Um, when you say specific coding uh, to create these, I guess I'm not entirely sure what you mean by by that. Maybe you just want to elaborate on your question a bit more. If you're asking, you know, do we need to to run these searches? Okay, so if you're you're running a specific search. And if the search doesn't exist, is new code is new coding required? Um, well, I think I mean generally how it works is you would generally how the software works is you would actually train the system based, you'd probably give it some example. You might run some keywords at first, such as you know, people without red hair. You get some documents back, and then you'd have to tell the system, well, you know, these documents actually relate to you know, the people without red hair, and these ones don't relate. It will then go and find more documents based off of what you've trained it. So you might start with a few keywords, um, and then you have to train it with you know, what documents come back, um, and then it will find you kind of more similar similar documents. Uh, I'm hoping that answers your question. Hopefully I'm understanding it correctly. Uh, okay. Um, are there any other uh, questions?
Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for attending today. Uh, hopefully it was helpful. Um, I believe the slides and the recording uh, will be sent out in the next um, few days. Um, if you have any other questions that you want to direct to me, uh, my email is, is directly here. Um, feel free to uh, reach out to me anytime kind of on this topic um, or any other questions you have. Okay. Uh, well, everyone, thank you very much for attending.